turn to 2 Samuel chapter 23, if you would, please. When you found it, stand with me as we begin reading at verse 14. I told you one of my mottos as I get older is if you can't be good, be short. <laughs> and I'll try to do that. I won't have to try. With a voice like this, you don't say a lot of frivolous stuff. And uh, so glad the Lord's helping my voice this best it's been. One of my other mottos is you either have to have interesting sermons or interesting socks. So we'll try to help you on that too. David was then in an hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed, said, Ah, oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well in Bethlehem, which is by the gate, and the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Lord, guide me and please empower me by your spirit to say what you want said. Bind the devil and those fallen angels that serve him. Help us to receive gladly the seed of your word into our heart soil. Bless the preaching and bless the invitation. Bless Brother Chapel and the people from this good church that are on that important tour. Give them safety and grace and good days. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever, sit down. <laughs> Oh, at least I didn't say shut up and sit down. <laughs> Have you ever had something so good to eat that nothing compared to it, but you could only get it one place? There's a town about three hours from our house called Shipshawana, an Amish town. Got a big flea market there. Take my wife there once every year. And about 15 minutes away, a little town called Middletown, Indiana, there is a bakery, Rise and Roll Bakery. They have a donut. I'm not a huge donut fan. Duncan has nothing I want. Nothing. Neither does Starbucks. If you like it, go get it. I'll keep the money. But they have a donut that has white cream in the middle. None of that Bavarian nonsense white cream, and it has a thick layer of caramel icing on top. Wow. We go get some every time we're there. We got in the now where we call ahead. Order some, make sure they get got enough for us when we get there. I'll tell you how good it is. One time I accidentally got some of it on my forehead. And my tongue slapped my brains out trying to get at it. <laughs> David felt that way about the water from the well of Bethlehem. It's where he grew up. It's what he drank. And to David, no water is so sweet. No water was so satisfying. No water was so special as the water from the well of Bethlehem. In our story, David is being pursued by King Saul. And he's in a cave, the cave of Dullam. And what I want you to notice first, the longing. David mentions a desire. It's not a request. We know that by the way he behaves later on. He's just talking out loud. Wow, what I wouldn't give for some of that water from the well of Bethlehem. Nothing so sweet, nothing so satisfying, nothing so special as the water from the well of Bethlehem. But David had a difficulty. David is hiding in a cave. Now, here's what's happened. David 
flees from Saul. On his journey, he and his companions stop at the village of Nob, and the priest named Ahimelech gives them some showbread from the altar. David goes on his journey, but when Saul gets there, somebody tells him, hey, Ahimelech helped David, he gave him some bread. Why'd you help David? Well, why wouldn't I? He's your son-in-law. You love him. Didn't know that Saul had turned on David. Saul says to his footmen and soldiers with him, kill him. They don't do it. But there's an Edomite serving Saul named Doeg. He kills 85 priests and the rest of the village. Women, men, children, animals. One of Ahimelech's son escapes. And where David is right now, he's just learned that news. He is devastated. He says, I have occasioned the death of all those people. Broken. David's hiding in a cave. Not only that, there's a second difficulty. David is hindered by his companions. Now the people that followed David turned out many of them to be courageous men. But they weren't first tier when they went to follow. As a matter of fact, the Bible says everybody that was in distress and everybody that was in debt and everybody that was discontented followed David. Sounds like an independent Baptist church. <laughs> That's who he's got. And there's a third difficulty. The well is held by conquerors. The Bible says that Bethlehem, at Bethlehem now there was a garrison of the Philistines. That's a military outpost. The enemy of Israel, their biggest enemy, fighting for the same piece of land, had conquered that area and held that well. Notice not only the longing Notice the loving. Three people heard what David said and decided to do something about it. Notice that they were attentive to his words. Um, they did not get a command. They did not, I wish somebody give me some water. Well, about them, no one like that at all. Man, I wish I could have some of that water. Oh, I know it would probably be impossible, but that's the best water in the world. No water so sweet as the water from the well of Bethlehem. No water so satisfying as the water from the well of Bethlehem. No water so special to me as the water from the well of Bethlehem. They were attentive to his words. A good follower does more than obey the commands of the leader. A good follower pays attention to the leader to know their heart. Brother Scott Cowling, been on our staff for probably 28 years, 27, as loyal and faithful of a staff member as you can ever imagine, runs our addictions ministry, The Bridge. And uh, by the way, Brother Crabb has been just tremendously helpful with that, getting curriculum out to help other churches. Brother Cowling's greatest indictment of another staff member was this. Preacher, he doesn't have your heart. That was a death sentence from Scott Cowling. Hey, what is God's heart? What does he like? What does he love? What matters to him? Now, you can be saved and not know it. The Bible says that he made known his ways unto Moses, Psalm 103 his acts unto the children of Israel. Children of Israel knew what God did. Moses knew why God did it, his ways. They were attentive to his words. They acted on his wishes. They weren't instructed, they weren't commanded. David, I don't think, knew they went. But they did what they knew he wanted. Both our daughters, I'm very glad for this, graduate from college here. Both met their husbands here. I'm not so glad for that. <laughs> no, great sons-in-law. 
And uh, our younger daughter, Katie, could have been a lawyer. She's always parsing things and looking for a loophole. One time she was wearing something and Mrs. Weaver, very kindly, said to her, now Brother Chapel prefers we don't wear that. And Katie said, oh, okay. A few days later, she's wearing it again. Mrs. Weaver spoke to her. Katie said, well, I didn't know it was against the rules. I just thought he didn't like it. <laughs> it may not have been in the handbook, but as part of the pastor's heart. It wasn't any big thing. I think she's wearing army boots or something like that. <laughs> they were attentive to his words. They, were, they acted on his wishes. They were aggressive in their work. Now, I've never heard a sermon on this passage. I've heard it referenced in sermons. And Brother Asperson, here's what I always imagine. These guys sneak off and uh, they go in darkness, they grab some water from the well and they come back. But the Bible says the well was in a garrison of the Philistines. And the Bible says, look at it, they break through the host. The three mighty men break, verse 16, through the host of the Philistines. They had to fight. And the Philistines were well armed and they were not. Not only that, it's about 13 miles from the cave of Dullam to the well of Bethlehem. If you walk really fast, you'll go four miles an hour. I got to push to stay at four miles an hour when I'm walking. Now I got to push to stay at one mile an hour, but when I'm in better shape, I'm getting better. I did do it a half hour on the elliptical the other day. I used to do an hour, but I did a half hour. And my next move is going to be, I'm going to start moving the pedals. <laughs> they were aggressive in their work. It was hard. It was a long distance, 13 miles there, 13 miles back. That's just shy of a marathon. No little thing. Fighting unarmed men going against armed soldiers. But notice this about the loving. David was appreciative of their work. When they brought that water back, he knew how far they'd gone. He knew the Philistines had the well. He knew what they had done. And here's what he said. He said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. It's worse, trust me, but maybe not tonight. And he poured the water out on the ground as an offering to the Lord. That was good water. He wanted it. There wasn't any water as sweet to David as the water from the well of Bethlehem. No water as satisfying as the water from the well of Bethlehem. No water as special as the water from the well of Bethlehem. But he couldn't drink it. He loved them back. Never doubt that your Savior loves you. Now, I say this often. The most important question you want to ask when you read the Bible is, so what? Not who cares, but so, what does that mean? So, how do I put that in practice in my life? So, what am I supposed to do? because of that. So here are the lessons. Number one, there's a lesson about service. I've got $100 in my pocket. I'll give it to you tonight after the service if you can show me from the Bible who those three men were. Now, people postulate, they speculate, but you get all kinds of different answers. They are never clearly distinguished. There are 30 mighty men and the three, somewhere in those 30, there were three that acted on the wishes of David. You see, servants do not matter. The Savior matters. Servants do not try to get a name for themselves. You watch out for these people always trying to 
build their profiles and get more traffic and have more people pay attention to them. Nah, servants don't build a name for themselves. They lift the name of the Savior. And servants don't need to be known. They want to make him known. You know, there are people in this room who will be miles ahead of me at the judgment seat. They're far greater servants of the Lord Jesus than I am. I don't know who they are. You don't either. There are widow ladies that live on an unbelievably tight budget to be able to give extra money to missions. There are people who quietly help college students encourage them along the way, never want to be in the limelight. There are people that are laboring on foreign fields under conditions you and I could not even imagine. We wouldn't go on a camping trip that was that primitive. I wouldn't go on one of any kind. I've done my share of camping. I liked it. It was wonderful. Right now, give me a soft bed, a good pillow, and a nice shower. A lesson about servants. Then there's a lesson about sacrifice. There were 400 people that followed David. They would stay with him. If there were 30, they were called mighty men. They would stand for him. But there were three that would go off in the dark of night across difficult trails, fight armed soldiers, grab some water, and take it back 13 miles to give to David. There were three who would sacrifice. Can I tell you, I got the pastor of First Baptist Church at Bridgeport for 44 years. Great church, God was good to us. They tell me 200 or more of our young people have gone out from our school and our church into Christian service. Amen. Do you know what made that church great? I don't know. God did it. I got to go along for the ride. But I'll tell you one thing that I know God used. We had members that would run all the time and get water from the well. We'd take an offering and wedding rings would be in it. Never asked, never mentioned, never hinted. We had people, we asked them to work, I think three hours on a bus route. They'd work five, six, seven, eight hours. We had folks who would see something a little broken in need of repair. Nobody asked them. You'd just see them out there one day fixing it, taking care of it. We had men that would spend hours under broken down buses held together with duct tape and bailing wire, making them run for the next Sunday, lying in the snow sometimes. You know what's made the Lancaster Baptist Church, the church it is. Had a lot of people run to the well of Bethlehem to get water. Your open house will be as successful as there are people who run to the well. You'll have as much fruit as you have people who don't go out a night or two, but some go every day, some go every night, some knock on hundreds, some on thousands of doors to get out the news. It's a lady in our church named Rose Sandoval. She's extremely quiet and her husband is more quiet. She's battling cancer, doing well. They watch our dog for us when we go out of town. They love our little dog. Rose Sandoval, in her early days as a member of First Baptist Church, brought 70 visitors on one Sunday. Not outgoing. Not effervescent. Sweet, lovely, quiet lady. So how'd you do that? Well, she just kept running back and forth to the well. The lesson about sacrifice. Sacrifice is seldom commanded. The tithe is the Lord's. After that, we give offerings. Hope you're generous in your missions conference. Hope your great missions program goes forward by leaps and bounds. But you know what you're required to give to missions? Whatever you want. Every man as he purposeth in his heart. 
I used to tell our people, we had big offerings. The only pressure I want you to feel to give in this offering is from God. You just ask God what he wants you to give. But here's what happened. They asked God, they didn't like what he said, and they got mad at me. <laughs> Sacrifice not commanded. Our church allowed us, our family, to take a mission trip to Grenada one time. Brother Dennis Celestine. He started it now, but it was just in the early stages of casting a vision to build an orphanage. Our daughter, Chris, was 16. She said, Mom, Dad, could I stay here and work at the orphanage? I'd miss my friends, but I'll be okay. There was an orphanage in which for her to work, there is one now. Nobody said, 16-year-old girl, you ought to stay here in Grenada away from your parents and away from your friends and away from school. She offered. Katie was in the sixth grade. Katie had just gotten a Game Boy, Nintendo Game Boy, the handheld game unit just out from Nintendo, the coolest thing in the world right then. Had different cartridges, you play different games. Preacher had two boys named Dwight and Dwayne. And Katie let those boys play with a Game Boy. They'd never seen anything like it in the world. House didn't have a television. And they were in awe of it. Last day, we're getting ready to leave. Katie calls us in and she said, Mom, Dad, is it okay if I give my Game Boy to Dwight and Dwayne? Sacrifice. Never commanded, but it must cost. It's not a sacrifice if it doesn't cost. Not a sacrifice if it's the five bucks you got left over in your budget anyway. And then there is in our story a lesson about the Savior. Now, David's an example in many ways of the Lord Jesus. You understand that? At this time in his life, David has been anointed. Samuel took the horn of oil, said, you'll be the next king of Israel. He has not been appointed. He's not king. He's not prince. He's not nothing. He's a fugitive. He's a runaway. He is a man with a price on his head. Saul has 3,000 soldiers trying to catch him and kill him. But there are 400 people that will stay with David and serve David. And 30 that will be mighty in their fight for him. And three that will sacrifice for him. You know, in the 70s, in virtually every state in America, the largest church was an independent, fundamental Baptist church of any kind. Not so now. In the 30s, H.L. Mencken said, you take a train across this country, throw an egg out of the train any place you want, and you're liable to hit a fundamentalist. We were the majority. More people agreed, or at least went along with us, than disagreed with us. We were popular. You had to come to us to get elected. Not so now. Now, your governor twists scripture to make it look like the Lord Jesus is in favor of murdering babies. Nobody seems too bothered by it. Now, you better be nice to the Muslims. You better be nice to the transgender. You better be nice to everybody. But you can say anything you want about a Christian. We don't sacrifice much. But it costs us a little. It does cost us some at the workplace. It costs us some in the neighborhood. It costs us some with our families. They think a lot of you joined a cult. Because you go to church more than once a week. If they knew what you gave, they'd really be upset. And I want to say something. I'm glad I have the opportunity to stand and serve my Savior at a time when it costs at least a little bit. He's worthy. I want to get water from the well of Bethlehem for him. But can I tell you about another well in Bethlehem? 
It was dug in darkness. It was operated in obscurity, at least in the early days. Its walls were not made of masonry, but of a manger. It's a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Drink of any other water, you'll thirst again. Drink of this water, you'll never thirst. The Spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst drink of the water of life freely. There's another well in Bethlehem. His name is Jesus. He deserves our sacrifice. 